Hey guys, uh, quick note up front here before we get started. As you know, I'm always looking for ways to turn new people onto this podcast. And I learned this week of two new venues to do just that, to promote podcasts like this one. But of course, I can't do the promoting myself. There are rules against that sort of thing. So I'm asking if some of you might be willing to help out. The first venue is Product Hunt the site that you're probably familiar with. And this is the one I'm really excited about. If you go to producthunt.com forward slash podcasts, you'll find that you can share recent episodes of any podcast. So it would be cool if some of you would be willing to take a minute or two to share this episode or really any episode when it airs, that would be great. I think that actually the product hunt audience would overlap quite nicely with ours. So I'm I'd be really thrilled if we could always get uh, a link to all the new episodes on Product Hunt when they go up. And the second one is NPR's new podcast directory thingy. And the link to this one is a bit more complicated because it's a a Google Doc where you submit um, one particular episode to their directory. So for this one, think back to your favorite episode of this podcast. And if you could be so kind, submit that to NPR, not... The most recent one necessarily, but your favorite one. Think of the the one maybe that made you a fan of this show. The link to the NPR form is in the show notes. So yeah, hit on that. And also, um, if you could submit to Product Hunt whenever the mood strikes you after a new episode. Again, helping out like this is the best way to show your thanks and to turn more people onto this project. So thanks for the help. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Tom Hadfield was the founder of SoccerNet, which is still the premier soccer website in the world today. But as the title to this episode says, Tom actually began SoccerNet when he was 12 or 13 years old. So certainly, Tom takes the cake out of anyone we've spoken to so far for having been in the internet game his entire life. Tom tells us the unique story of SoccerNet's founding and how it ended up with ESPN today. And as a bonus, since Tom is the first person that we've spoken to from outside of North America on this show, he's also able to give us our first look at how the web took off in other parts of the world. So please enjoy Tom Hadfield. Tom Hadfield, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Hey, Brian, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we're, we'll get into your story in a second, but actually you're the first person um, not from North America that we've had on, on the show. And so um, because of that, I was wondering if you could start off by telling us your recollection of how people in Britain got online. You know, in, in, in the U.S., you know, we had things like AOL, Prodigy, that sort of thing. But in, in the early 90s, as the web starts to come about, how, how are people in Britain getting online and learning about it? Well, I was born in 1982, so I was 12 in 1994 when I um, first experienced the internet at my friend Rupert's house. His dad was a computer programmer, and uh, so he was fortunate enough to have a 386 um, with a 14.4 modem. And um, I basically camped out at Rupert's house for about three months. I slept there most nights uh, until his parents called my parents and begged them to uh, take me back home. Uh, so I was uh, lucky enough for my parents to buy me a computer for Christmas in 1994. And in those days in the UK, um, you know, we had all the AOL CDs, uh, you know, in, in the mail as well. But um, there were a few local internet service providers who would charge a monthly fee for access. And then you had to pay for local phone calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was about, um, it was a few pounds um, 
uh, it was expensive, right? It was a few pounds per minute. And um, so my phone bill in that first month in January was just over a thousand pounds, which was a wow. huge amount of money back <laughs> wow. then. Yeah. And um, uh, so we, we switched to a um, unlimited um, provider, um, ISP, who then cut me off uh, because although they said unlimited, they didn't really mean it. <laughs> and and um, uh, but yeah, I mean, our experience of the internet was very much the same um, as uh, as you guys in North America. Uh, there were communities of geeks, I guess, um, in each town, and uh, I actually used to get together with the group. Um, in my hometown of Brighton, England, at a pub, even though I was only 12 years old, um, everyone would sit outside when I when I attended. And um, my mother was always very concerned when she dropped me off. <laughs> and um, uh, But yeah, I, I pretty quickly got plugged into the kind of internet subculture um, in the UK in the early early part of 1995. So you're, you're going directly on to the web and, and, and Usenet and things like that. You're not going through some sort of proprietary service at first? No, that's right. Yeah, I had a, a, a dial-up ISP. Um, I spent most of my time in Internet Relay chat rooms and on Usenet. Um, uh, and so, and I was a big soccer fan, and so I um, was a, a you know a regular participant in the in the Rec Sport Soccer uh, Usenet group, um, which is kind of like a web forum um, today, uh, but uh, but not on the web. And um, and then. A group of us used to chat about soccer um, in the Internet Relay chat room, which is um, kind of like live group chat, basically. And uh, uh, and so that was uh, what I was spending most of my time doing in '95. The web was really a kind of uh, a, a small part of my uh, my online experience. Although I do remember um, visiting my first website and, and seeing a frog get dissected on a science website, and just thinking it was so cool that. Um, all of the world's information at that time it felt like all of the world's information but uh, clearly only a small part of it was uh, was available on the web so uh, this is 94 95 so you're what 12 13 years old at this I, time? I was yeah I was 12 and a half um, uh, that Christmas when I got online so and and, and you said you're, you're you're growing up in Brighton um, and so but you're because of getting on Usenet and, and IRC and stuff you're you're starting to talk with people all around the world and you're you're talking with expatriates all around the world who might not have access to something really simple like uh the the latest scores right well amazingly uh if you lived in australia in early part of 1995 and you followed the english premier league soccer you had to either wait for the ship to arrive with a newspaper on it to find out who had won the games that weekend, uh, or listen to a two or three minute um, radio update on the BBC World Service. And so, although it was only 20 years ago, um, there really was a lack of live information about um, about sports. And so, uh, the internet, initially kind of Usenet and, and IRC uh, chat rooms, was was how most of the world's population was was finding out uh, what was happening in the English Premier League. And and you start to become the guy that's that's providing some of some of these details. Well, I think I probably had more time than a lot of other people. You know, I basically sat in my bedroom and typed up um, football results. Uh, that was um, a hobby, basically. And and so initially, I would post them in the in the Usenet groups. Um, sometimes we'd get requests for the second division games or the third division games or what was happening in Scotland, what was happening in Germany. Um, and I would literally copy the results off um, what we called CFAX in England, which was basically um, a, a visual information service available on the television. Um, and so I would spend most of my days just typing up uh, football results. Uh, I began emailing them to people um, in the uh, kind of spring of 1995 and um, and then eventually had the idea of uh, putting them all on a very basic uh, HTML web page. Um, using one of these free website creators that actually came out of Ohio State University. Um, Do you remember the, the name of it? Uh, well, the guy who created it was called Doug Stevenson, and I've tried to track him down ever since. Huh. Um, uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was one of the popular, um, uh, it was offered for free by um, Ohio State University uh, PhD student, I think. And, um, and so that's really where I uh, kind of began to learn some very basic HTML, just putting up these soccer results on a very basic um, web page uh, using the pre-tag, which basically meant there wasn't much formatting. And you're hosting this through through your ISP account? Uh, initially, it was through um, 
uh, Ohio State University. And so, uh, and embarrassingly at the time, it was called Mysterious Meg's Premier League Results Service. Uh, <laughs> as being the 12 year old that I was, I decided that Mysterious Meg was going to be my um, um, pseudonym for some reason, embarrassingly. And, um, uh, and so, this was before. Uh, I conceived of the idea of creating a uh, kind of de- dedicated commercial um, soccer service. This was really the hobby. Um, uh, that was just the easiest way to, to keep people up to date, basically. So the you put it up on the web and sometime in, in mid-95, you think? That's right, yeah. I mean, this was through the spring. The, 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 the soccer season ended in May, so right. it, it must have been uh, kind of uh, February, March, April. Um, it was probably the uh, the, the early days. So I've I've read a couple different versions of how this turns into soccer net. Um, uh, what do you what do you recall when it suddenly turns into something that's bigger than just just a hobby kind of thing? Well, it, 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 even once it became soccer net, it remained a hobby for a couple of years. Um, uh, but I do remember running into the bathroom in my family home where my dad was getting ready for work. He was a journalist on the Daily Mail newspaper. In London, which is a national newspaper, and um, uh, had had recently kind of heard about the internet through colleagues at work. Um, and I said, "Hey, Dad, I've got an idea. We should create a soccer website called SoccerNet, um, and we should get the Daily Mail involved and and use some of uh, the content that they're producing for the newspaper uh, and, and put it up online so people all over the world can read them." And um, so my dad and I began talking about the idea. You know, he, he was a workaholic and, um, you know, uh, got on the train up to London um, uh, six days a week for most of the day. And, and so it was often kind of early morning conversations as he was getting ready for work. Um, but through kind of June and early July, um, we began sketching out uh, together um, what this uh, soccer website would look like. And really, in those days, the, there were no... Um, kind of comprehensive uh, sports sites. And so the idea of having a dedicated page for each Premier League team, putting player biographies online, club histories, match reports, league tables, fixtures, results, uh, it it wasn't really something that was done, not just for soccer, but for any sport um, in those days. And so um, uh, through the summer of 1995, uh, we uh, began putting together some sketches for the site, uh, getting ready for to have a conversation with the Daily Mail about um, about them being involved in the in the creation of uh, of Soccernet dot com. Uh, and you, I guess, your dad would have been aware that maybe the Daily Mail was was interested in in digital and in going online at this point. I think that's probably an exaggeration of the Daily Mail's awareness of what the internet was <laughs> in nineteen ninety five. I mean, they were a, a kind of an old school newspaper. Um, and just like other media organizations, it really took them a few years to wake up to um, the internet. But yes, uh, we we began a conversation with the Daily Mail. They agreed to um, sponsor the site in return for five thousand um, uh, pounds in the in July of nineteen ninety five. I remember the phone call, um, and we used that five thousand pounds to hire um, a couple of local designers, Simon and Neil Turner. Um, uh, to help us uh, create the site and and uh, and launch Soccernet on the first day of the Premier League, which uh, I believe was August the nineteenth, nineteen ninety five. I had read that within three days you 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 go into the logs and you realize you've had twenty thousand visitors. Is that? Yeah, I forget I forget I forget the numbers, but it, we we definitely got daily um, email analytics uh, that I'd set up and um, and it was just phenomenal, right? The um, uh, not not just seeing the kind of unique IPs, but also the volume of emails that we were getting from people all over the world uh, asking for uh, additional information that wasn't available. Uh, I remember vividly, you know, hundreds, like hundreds, maybe even thousands of emails coming in, uh, and and just being unable to even read them all, let alone reply to them. Um, but yeah, it soon became clear, you know, through kind of August, September, that there was a real kind of thirst for. Um, information about the um, about soccer uh, from from people all over the world. So forgive me. I, uh, these are back to basic detail questions. But again, you're just hosting this through your ISP. Do, do you ever have to get buy a dedicated machine or anything like that? Uh, yeah. So at this point, we were hosted by an internet service provider near my hometown that was called Pinnacle uh, in Crawley in England. Um, 
I forget exactly when the um, we started causing bandwidth uh, and server um, issues for them. Um, but but the, the the level of internet service provision that they were able to provide to their other customers was was quite quickly um, um, impeded by the fact that they were hosting Socinet. Um, and uh, and so we we began talking with them about a dedicated server and and um, and increasing the overall bandwidth that they that they had as an ISP. And so um, yeah, hosting challenges were um, kind of prevalent throughout the first few years of of Socinet for sure. And so for this first year, are, is it still basically just scores, league tables, uh, player biographies, and things like that? Yeah, the, the uh, I was checking the Wayback Machine uh, yesterday, actually, um, uh, which was nostalgic as we um, kind of uh, were, were constantly adding new pages. So I remember when we added Soccer Flash, which was um, news stories. Um, I remember when we added Soccer File, which was... Um, results, league tables, fixtures, and match reports, all of which were manually entered in Notepad. Um, the league tables in particular, I remember, um, were, were very time-consuming uh, for all eight divisions in England and Scotland. Um, and uh, I think almost from day one, we were doing live score updates on a Saturday afternoon. So I was 13 by this point, um, would meet my friends in town on a Saturday lunchtime, to go shopping and then would get home by 3 p.m., turn the radio on, turn the TV on, and every time there was a goal, um, would would update the HTML file and drag it across on FTP. Um, and uh, and so now people in Australia could literally follow the games in real time by by reloading the page on a on a Saturday afternoon. But it was. Uh, you know, quickly became apparent that there were games on Sunday, there were games on Monday evening, Wednesday evening was a, was a big time, um, Saturday was the busiest. And so, in fact, it started to dominate pretty much my whole life because, um, of course, once the games had finished, we then needed to get match reports up and update the league tables, which, you know, took some time. And um, uh, and meanwhile, we're trying to build out the, the general content available on the site, like player biographies and club histories and transfer news um, and, uh, so it was really thousands of flat HTML files, um, pretty quickly. Um, there were no, um, content management systems that we were using or, uh, you know, even, it even took me a year or two to learn some basic Perl scripting so that I could, um, uh, do updates more easily. Um, we didn't have the server side include, uh, files. And so every time we wanted to, you know, change the logo, uh, or uh, you know, change the background um, uh, image. We'd have to go through. I'd have to go through um, thousands of HTML files manually and and um, and uh, update them all one by one. Uh, really, really doing it by hand. Um, were you able to do any community things like message boards or anything like that, or was that beyond your your abilities at the time? So, so the soccer community online uh, in 95, 96 was largely both uh, Usenet news groups um, and email mailing lists. And so, and there was quite a mature kind of um, group of mailing lists, often dedicated to individual clubs. Um, we didn't do any of that, actually. Um, you know, even through the late 90s, uh, we were really primarily an information resource. Uh, I do remember conceiving of um, soccer netters. Uh, which was going to be the community site where um, soccer fans could create their own uh, web pages and um, and profiles. Um, uh, but really, it was such a mammoth job keeping the information up to date. Uh, I mean, really, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. I I kind of rarely left my house. Actually, it's not an exaggeration to say I used to sleep at my keyboard um, pretty frequently. Um, and um, and so even just keeping the information up to date became uh, became a um, kind of all-encompassing um, uh, effort. Um, Euro 96 was was a was a big uh, breakthrough, watershed time for you. And uh, I think you maybe cover the tournament on behalf of Yahoo or get Yahoo's sponsorship around that time? That's right. I received an email out of the blue from Jerry Yang at, at Yahoo, um, uh, who went on to great fame. Uh, and he basically proposed a relationship um, where Soccernet would provide the live scores for Yahoo Europe, uh, Yahoo UK in Europe, and um, and so we set up a feed uh, where the the data would be kind of pushed to Yahoo for inclusion on their site in return for kind of co co-brand, branding and 
so that drove a lot of traffic to, to Soconet, and, and it was really the professionalization of Soconet in many ways. Um, we were, at that time, if not the most popular website in Europe during the month of Euro 96, um, uh, possibly second. And, um, and again, it's really a 14-year-old boy and, um, and his dad kind of updating uh, some flat HTML files. Uh, and so, uh, so yes, yeah, so Euro 96 was, um, was a moment we started to get a lot of uh, attention. And, and the beginnings of kind of commercial interest, um, we um, sold our first advertising during Euro uh, 96. Um, we had... Um, even earlier than that, actually, being doing um, the first fantasy soccer game online, it was called Dream League um, with uh, with Peter Rowe, and we'd really moved the Daily Mail's fantasy soccer game uh, onto onto the web, um, and uh, and a number of other kind of commercial relationships. We used to advertise um, a, a company called Zetters, which was a um, in England, it's called the Football Pools, but it's basically uh, gambling. Um, and um, and so some of the checks that were coming in began to pay for the the hosting fees um, that were that were racking up. And of course, at this time, you know, uh, there were there were other efforts in the in the soccer space. And so um, I remember Carling, uh, a beer company that sponsored the Premier League at the time, mm-hmm. launched mm-hmm. La- launched Carling Net, which was the official Premier League. Uh, website and so they too were providing live score updates um, on, on Saturday afternoons and, and a lot of uh, information about clubs and so we began to see some competition uh, going into the summer of 1996 as well. If you'll indulge me and the, the listeners will indulge me um, because Euro 96 is what got me into football. Um, I was 18, you know, just graduated high school and I, I spent uh, two weeks in England, um, you know, for the senior senior trip or whatever. I think I got there when England beat Spain, uh, or maybe it was England was playing Scotland. I, I remember England beating Spain. I remember England losing to Germany in the <laughs> in the semis on penalties, of course. How could um, any of, How could any of us forget that? <laughs> right, Gareth South, Southgate. Um, so I was a huge. I came back from England totally uh, into football all of a sudden. Uh, I ended up becoming an Arsenal fan because at this point. Um, you know, the whole England back line are, are Arsenal players. Um, and l- so all of a sudden, I, I, I want all this information on, on the Premier League, on, on football. And, and so I was a huge, huge uh, soccer net user. Um, and I remember uh, playing the Fantasy League, all this stuff. And, and again, it's sort of, you know, obvious today, but at the time it was revolutionary that I I could live, you know, a continent away and still follow this stuff. You know, it's crude today now that you can watch every single Premier League game on a weekend <laughs> on television. Um, but yeah, it, it it blew my mind, and the, the very fact that I was able to become a football fan is is due to soccer net. <laughs> so I, I personally thank you there. Well, I I really appreciate that. You know, it was it was actually really fun. You know, I I was of course a teenager when all this was happening. I was fourteen um, that summer, and so. Um, you know, I was, um, meant to be attending school. And so I, um, was fortunate enough to live a few minutes away from, um, my local public school. And so I would often either skip class or, or come home at lunchtime, um, uh, to, uh, to update the site. I, I remember installing a telephone in my bedroom and then updating the phone number with the school registrar's office. So whenever they called my parents to complain about me not being at school, they would leave a message for Mr. Ha- Mr. Hadfield uh, on the on the telephone in my bedroom. And um, and so I was, of course, just juggling being a kid. Uh, and, you know, I played soccer myself at weekends. So I was a goalkeeper um, for the um, uh, the, the Brighton uh, um, and Hope Albion uh, kind of under-16s team. And so... Um, it was kind of fun, you know, like uh, the, it was, it was really enjoyable doing something that felt meaningful and, and felt like it was, um, helping people and, and, and getting attention. And so, uh, you know, I, I was completely self-taught in a sense that I, you know, felt like I needed to learn, uh, a lot of, you know, I taught myself pill scripting and, and that kind of stuff to, to help make, make the site, um, easier to update. Um, and, uh, so people often, you know, now 15, 20 years later, say, you know, gosh, that's amazing, a 14-year-old creating a website. And, of course, that's the least remarkable part of the story because today literally millions of 12, 
14, 16 year olds are, are creating their own websites uh, and teaching themselves to code. And so I really just feel like it was, um, if nothing else, a kind of coincidence of timing that uh, um, that I was, you know, fortunate enough to live in a family that had access to the internet. Um, uh, just as uh, you know, millions of people were, were starting to get online looking for looking for soccer results um, in the mid nineties. Well, let's let's uh, finish up the story of SoccerNet. I I had read that you know you're doing this all by yourself. You must have gotten close to burnout, and I think I read that you were considering shutting it down before the Daily Mail gets back in touch with your dad. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So. Um, you know, my father was a journalist on the Daily Mail, as I mentioned, um, an investigative journalist, and and uh, went to go and work for the uh, Express newspaper um, in the probably the the late part of '95. Uh, in fact, uh, sorry, uh, maybe early '96. Um, and uh, there was a kind of ongoing conversation with the Daily Mail about what their exact involvement in SoccerNet was, and some question of ownership. Um, um, we began to figure that out with the Daily Mail um, uh, in just after the European Championships, uh, and, and my father left the Express newspaper to come and be the full-time editor of Soccernet, working from home, sitting at a computer alongside me in October 1996, um, and um, uh, and so. Uh, again, that was really the profession. You know, we now had you know two people working on the site uh, full time, essentially, uh, my dad and I. And it, you know, it really changed my relationship with my father, as you can imagine. He had been uh, up in London writing, you know, uh, you know, news stories for, uh, for for many years while I was growing up, and and now we found ourselves sitting next to each other on the computers, um, working together on the same project, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Kind of sharing a, sharing this passion together, and so you can only imagine how uh, frustrating that must have been for my mother at uh, you know Sunday dinner uh, when there was nothing else to talk about other than um, you know the the work that needed to be done on Soccernet that evening. Um, so yeah, it became a became a um, um, you know that my my father and I were really kind of uh, working together closely on this um, full time from October '96 onwards. And you do things like um, I think you made a. There may have been discussions to cover the '98 World Cup with like CBS or CBS Sportsline or something like that. That's right. Yeah. So in, um, I think it was probably early 1997. Uh, at this point, we'd moved the internet service provider to EasyNet uh, in London, which was a different internet service provider where we could have uh, 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 more dedicated um, um, hosting capacity. Uh, in January 1997. Uh, the Daily Mail hooked us up with Sportsline, um, and we, we, my father and I, took a trip out to Fort Lauderdale um, to see Mike Levy and, and others there. Um, and we began talking about a partnership with Sportsline for the World Cup in 1998. Uh, so this was about 18 months before the World Cup, but it, it was clear that the United States was likely to qualify. Um, and that uh, soccer was uh, becoming very popular in the U.S. Uh, and so through 1997, uh, in addition to manually updating all the scores and league tables, uh, etc., um, uh, began working with um, Sportsline on, on the World Cup site. Uh, and it was probably the end of 1997. Uh, America had qualified and... Um, there was the World Cup draw, I remember, I think December the 4th, 1997, um, which was a, a huge kind of live event in the soccer world. Um, and, um, and, and so we kind of uh, announced the, the, the partnership with Sportsline where they were um, kind of uh, investing a lot of technical resource and, and design and, and content uh, in the, um, the, the, the soccer net sports line, uh, world cup, uh, kind of microsite that we, that we built with them. And, and that, at that point we, you know, we're, we're now using kind of live content feeds and wire feeds, um, and, um, and starting to use some of the content management system, um, that, that sports line had introduced us to. And, and, um, and so it was much less of a kind of, uh, manual effort basically, um, at least, at least on the World Cup site, um, that we were kind of running in parallel through the early part of 1998 in the build-up to the the World Cup in France, which took place uh, that summer in 1998. Is it still just you and your dad, or at this point, are, are you're able to hire other people and there's a, a team involved? 
Uh, well, so the World Cup was uh, was definitely kind of um, had resources from um, Sportsline, um, uh, many of them based in America. Um, but, but the primary kind of SoccerNet.com site uh, was was still very much only my my dad and I, and it was up until the day that we were no longer involved. Um, um, we had a, a journalist, uh, Jamie Fullerton, who used to write um, some uh, a weekly column uh, for us. Um, uh, so we had some help with a little bit of content generation, um, but, uh, but in terms of the, uh, kind of technical, um, and, and design side, it was, it was still very much my, my father and I. So tell me the story of how, um, SoccerNet ends up, um, at Disney where, or I guess ESPN now, but that's at Disney. Tell me, uh, how your involvement in, in SoccerNet, uh, ends. Well, yeah. So, and there's a, a little story in between, which was, um, the World Cup in France in 1998, which was, you know, we're now into the full swing uh, of the dot com boom, and uh, the internet has become commercial. Uh, the um, big American media companies like CBS and ESPN were kind of waking up to the opportunity and making significant investments in the soccer world. Murdoch, um, through his ownership in Sky uh, and their exclusive rights to the Premier League. Uh, um, televised games uh, was beginning to wake wake up to the internet and so so the world cup was a huge commercial moment um in the emergence of uh online um soccer uh we sold um i believe it was a million dollars worth of advertising and half a million dollars worth of merchandise um during the month of the world cup uh in june 1998 uh largely leaning on the the, the sports line uh, kind of sales team uh for, for much of that um, and, uh, it was a huge success for soccer net. We were, we were the, the number one, um, soccer website in the world still. We, we always had been, and we always have been, um, since then. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and so the world cup really kind of cemented that position. It was, it was kind of quality coverage of the world cup, including some video clips, um, uh, which was a, a first for online soccer and, um, uh, and, and so things had really professionalized and become commercial um, during that summer of 1998, uh, which uh, which kicked off this um, amazing year, basically, where um, uh, we, you know the the American media companies were were beginning to come over to Europe and and acquiring the kind of amateur sports websites um, like Golf Web and um tennis net um and um and ultimately um uh, soccer net and so the um daily mail uh, at this point um had set up a uh, a new media division called associated new media uh and they were um uh beginning to make significant investments in, in some of their online properties um we uh, had a, a quite a lengthy converse, a series of conversations with the Daily Mail uh, that ultimately uh, resulted in us um, selling Soccernet to the Daily Mail um, for a relatively small amount of money. Um, but we felt like it was important to align ourselves with a media company in order to be able to compete in this uh, in this new world. Uh, we, there was really a significant investment that was needed in Soccernet um, to um, to keep it uh, kind of ahead of the pack of, of competitors that were getting into the space. Um, and so, um, we essentially sold Soccernet to, um, to the Daily Mail. Um, like, like all, uh, kind of transactions, it was kind of more complicated and messy than that. Uh, but we were very happy with the outcome and, um, uh, ultimately were able to pay off my parents' mortgage. I mean, it wasn't much more than that, but it w- but it felt like a lot of money at the time. And, and, um, I remember being very happy that we'd kind of made it. Um, uh, this was probably... Uh, in the kind of spring of 1999, maybe the summer of 1999, um, and uh, and we had begun working. My father and I had begun working on a business plan for a, a new company that was called Schoolsnet, uh, which was an online education company. Um, and we were out raising venture capital for that business. I was 17 at this point. Let me let me interrupt you there because I'm curious about this. Um, first of all, you are, you're 17 and you, you become sort of a little bit of a celebrity because of your status with soccer net and things like that. So are you, are you able to, uh, take these meetings with VCs sort of based on, on that previous success and people are willing to talk to you? 
Well, I think celebrity in the, in the summer of 99, celebrity is definitely overstating it. I had uh, done a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a few television interviews. I've been on some, some daytime chat shows, um, all of which I regret now, of course. It's very awkward, um, spotty teenager, um, kind of failing to make eye contact with anyone uh, as I kind of explained what the internet was to the British public. Um, and uh, so it was really in kind of late 1999, um, in fact, it was uh, probably the summer of 1999 um, when the Daily Mail called us into the into the office, um, uh, and and there was some paperwork to be completed. Basically, they they mentioned that they were selling stock in it. Uh, we didn't know who to uh, or how much for, um, and we'd never transferred ownership of the domain Socinet.com as part of the earlier um, uh, conversation with them, and so so they. Um, agreed to make an additional payment uh in return for um signing over the domain um socanet.com um and um and so at that point we knew that socanet was going to be sold uh probably to an american media company um uh so we we transferred the domain um received a little bit of extra money um for that uh, and it was really um probably i think it was august 1999 um, when we read in the newspaper that Soconet had been sold to ESPN, uh, initially 60% of the site was sold for 15 million pounds, and then the remaining 40% was sold for 10 million pounds, which means in total ESPN had paid 25 million pounds for, for Soconet, um, which in those days was about $40 million. Um, and, um, you know, this is in the context of the bubble in 1999, mm, right? It, mm. was, it, wasn't, it wasn't one of the biggest deals, but it's still a lot of money. And, um, and so that's when the media really um, began to pick up on the story that this site had been created by a teenager. Um, I remember um, I was on the front page of the Financial Times um, in August 99, just after the company was sold. And, um, of course, by this time, mentally, we'd already moved on and, and uh, you know, we're, we're creating Schoolsnet, Um but it was certainly helpful that that media coverage. Um, uh, there was a full page in Time magazine, I remember, in Europe. Um, uh, you know about kind of teenage uh, this, this kind of teenage whiz kid, which was um, uh, always kind of painful as I kind of then went back to school to finish my A levels, and and um, there was this kind of perception that I was an internet millionaire. Um, uh, that, that sadly wasn't true, right? I mean, we, although it was true that Soconet had been created uh, in my bedroom and, and, and was sold to ESPN for $40 million, we didn't own the site when it was sold. Um, and um, but, but journalists often write the story that they, that they want to write. Right. And, um, and uh, so, yes, it was helpful with the, with the, with the financing for Schoolsnet. Um, we ended up raising uh, about £700,000 uh, from angel investors, uh, in late 1999. Um, and then as the NASDAQ crashed in March 2000, um, I believe the, the first kind of significant drop in the NASDAQ was around March the 10th, 2000. Um, by this time, we were in um, offices in London. Schoolsnet was in offices in London. We had you know hired a team of uh, teachers and designers to be creating interactive learning materials. Um, and we fortunately managed to close our, I guess you'd call it our Series A round now, um, which was six point seven five million pounds, about ten million dollars, um, literally as the Nasdaq was crashing uh, in in March two thousand. I was seventeen at that time and um, was still attending classes um, uh, at school. I wouldn't say that that was my main focus, and uh, it never really had been. But um, but I, I did manage to complete my A levels, but. Um, but I, I certainly wasn't a very academic student um, because I was basically putting my suit on and getting the train up to London every day um, uh, as we were as we were building Schoolsnet in the kind of spring and, and summer of, of 2000. Just one more question out of uh, curiosity again. What was the, the, the VC environment like in Britain in, say, 1999? Um, just because just I have no knowledge of, of what VC was like outside of Silicon Valley at this point. Yeah, so I'm probably not best placed to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we weren't necessarily plugged into the venture capital community. Um, uh, in, but the, in like, the the people that give you money, they are they're not Silicon Valley people. They they are they're it's Britain and and so there is 
there is VC in Britain at this point that that's uh, investing in in internet companies. That's right. That's right. And there were and and we put together a group of angel investors initially. Um, uh, and so there was kind of um, speculative investments being made by Pi Net Worth individuals um, um, that would be known as kind of angel investors today. And that's really w- that was where we got our our kind of uh, seed round from. Um, our Series A round um, had a couple of strategic investors, a, a local newspaper group um, called NewsQuest, um, the, a local um, IT solutions company called FDM. Um, the chairman of FDM was also the chairman of my soccer club. Uh, and so we kind of negotiated that deal in the changing rooms of uh, Salt Lane United uh, in, uh, in summer 2000. That was a, a $2 million, a £2 million investment um, from FDM and, and um, uh, so we, we didn't really have traditional VCs participating in, in our Series A um, uh, and so uh, but yes I mean there were you know just like um, I mean the, the bubble was, was kind of happening in England as well and there was clearly a lot of capital um, and a number of major IPOs on the London Stock Exchange um, uh, and, and so I, I imagine the bubble in the UK looks very much like the bubble in the US. Mm-hmm. So uh you you are able to successfully launch SchoolsNet, and I, I believe it's later sold to another company. But eventually, um, you it <laughs> you do get old enough that it's time to go to to college. And is is that when you come to the states? You go to to Harvard. Yeah, that's right. I um, you know, of course, had finished my A levels, uh, didn't get great grades. Um, when all my friends went off to university when they were 18, I, um, uh, you know, moved to London to, to create SchoolsNet. Um, uh, I got invited to the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos, uh, which is a, um, a conference basically in Switzerland, mm-hmm. um, and um, ended up meeting uh, some people who became very close friends, um, one of whom is now my brother-in-law. And so he uh, invited me to America and, and introduced me to his youngest sister, um, Kristen, who's now my wife, and um, uh, so basically, I fell in love with an American girl uh, in uh, in two thousand two, two thousand three, uh, when I was twenty and um, twenty one, and uh, ended up moving to America to be with her, and um, and at that point, um, went back to college uh, to do my undergraduate degree. A few years too late. Um, uh, you know, and learned to drive and did all the things that I should have done when I was a teenager. Um, uh, living life backwards is actually uh, what a few people have said about me. And, uh, and so, um, was in love in New York in, in 2003, 2004, um, and enrolled at college at Harvard college in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, never really having done any homework, right. Never really <laughs> having, never really having read any books or written any papers. Um, and, um, what, what were you studying? Uh, so I, um, one of the benefits of the American system is that you do a liberal arts degree, right? And you get exposure to science and history and English. Um, even though I was majoring in, um, politics, uh, it, it was a good chance for me to kind of broaden my, um, education and catch up on some of the things I've missed out on, um, uh, in, in, uh, from, from my British high school. And, um, but it was really in my junior year, I, I took a class with, um, a professor at the Harvard Engineering School called David Edwards, um, and uh, we—he's a very entrepreneurial professor actually, and, and had you know sold a number of companies uh, himself. And so uh, we ended up creating a company together um, just as I was finishing um, uh, my undergraduate degree. And so for uh, for four or five years after I graduated, I was the the CEO of a, a biotech company in in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, which I, I co-founded with um, David Edwards, um, uh, this professor at Harvard, and um, you know, and we raised about twenty-three million dollars in venture capital uh, during my time as CEO there, um, from two thousand and eight to two thousand and twelve, um, and uh, two thousand thirteen, um, and uh, you know, th- this was my my first company after college, and and um, uh, you know, and, and I'd obviously grown up something um, by by this time, and so uh, was uh, thirty by the time I um, uh, by the time I left uh, that company in in two thousand and thirteen. Do you feel like you're an accidental entrepreneur, or it was your destiny, or maybe it was in your blood, or something? 
Uh, well, I remember um, the word entrepreneur being used to describe me uh, in a newspaper article in 1996, uh, and I had to look up what it meant. <laughs> and so I guess to that extent, uh, it was accidental. Um, um, you know, I had always been kind of technical in nature and, and enjoyed kind of tinkering with uh, with computers and, and, and writing code. And so um, it, it, it really did begin as a hobby, you know, and, and, um, one of the benefits of, um, being an internet entrepreneur is that no one knows your age, right? I, I vividly remember realizing that as long as I could learn to spell properly in emails, then Jerry Yang from Yahoo would never know that I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I sat with an old fashioned paper dictionary next to, uh, next to my computer, um, and, um, you know, one of the other benefits of being a young internet entrepreneur is that you have a lot of time and freedom, right? And, and you don't have the responsibilities of a mortgage or putting the kids to bed. Um, and so, um, I think that young people have a real competitive advantage, which is not just that they don't know that they're likely to fail, um, uh, but also that they, um, can really kind of throw themselves a hundred percent into a project that they're excited about. Um, in, a, in a way that becomes much more difficult once you have a family and, and other responsibilities. Uh, Tom, tell us what, what you're up to today. Yeah, so I uh, am currently the CEO of Fetch. Um, my wife and I moved out to the Bay Area uh, in 2013 when my son Elliot was born. Uh, he's now two and a half. Um, I started a mobile commerce company called Fetch, um, which launched at TechCrunch Disrupt. Uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, we're a text-based buying assistant. Um, so you can send an SMS text message uh, from your phone describing something that you'd like to buy. It could be a flight or a hotel room or a food order or a product that you want to buy. You might want to send flowers to someone. You can just send a text message to Fetch. Um, uh, you get the price back in real time by text message. Uh, and you say, yes, please uh, buy that for me. You get the confirmation code back in real time. Uh, and, um, so now you can buy anything just by sending a quick text message without needing to, you know, go through the app and add to the shopping cart and go through the checkout. Um, so we're trying to make buying easy on mobile devices. And, um, uh, so that's what I, uh, that's what I'm currently working on. Uh, Tom Hatfield, thank you so much for sharing really what is, was, has been one of the, uh, most fun, uh, entrepreneurial stories that we've we've had the pleasure of, of having on this podcast hey brian it's been fun for me as well thanks so much